Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Joe Davich. I'm the executive director here at the Georgia Center for the Book. On behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book, DeKalb County Public Libraries, and the DeKalb Library Foundation, welcome to another of our continuing series of virtual author events. Tonight, we are so very pleased to once again welcome Poetry Atlanta for a second edition of the Mother Mary Comes to Me, a pop culture anthology reading. We are featuring more poets who did not attend the last reading. So we hope if you didn't see that first reading, you can hop over to our YouTube channel and watch it there right after we finish up this evening. I'd also like to note that if you would like to ask a question of any one of our poets this evening, feel free to type the question into the chat or use the Q&A feature that can be at the top of your screen or at the bottom of your screen, depending on which device you are using. And we'll ask it in turn once we finish the formal presentation. If you'd like to purchase a copy of the book this evening, we will drop a link into the chat. Karis Books is our bookseller this evening. They provide curbside pickup and mail to home service for you. So if you'd like to pick up a copy of this book, we can figure out a way to get it to you so you can enjoy all the poems in this anthology. I would also like to thank Colin Kelly and Karen Head are the two editors of this wonderful anthology of poetry. Poets themselves, Karen is the author of Sassing and My Pair of Sheer, and Colin is the author of Render and Midnight in a Perfect World. But right now I'd like to turn it over to Colin Kelly, who will give you a brief introduction, tell you a little bit more about who was reading this evening, and we'll start us off. Colin? Thank you, Joe. Hi, everyone. And thanks for joining us again for a second reading from Mother Mary Comes to Me. I'm here, I'm joined by my fabulous co-editor, Karen Head. Uh, we had such an incredible time uh, editing this anthology. It really was, I can easily say, one of the highlights of my career as a poet, uh, to, to be able to read all of these spectacular poems and put this book together and work with Madville Publishing, who did just such a, a beautiful job with the book. It is really just gorgeous. Um, and we're nominated for a Georgia Author of the Year Award, uh, which is very exciting. So keep your fingers crossed for that. They'll be announcing uh, in June. And we've had some really great reviews for the anthology. And if you haven't read those, go over to our Facebook page at Mother Mary Comes to Me. Uh, just look for that. And you'll, uh, you can follow along with all the readings that are coming up uh, and what we're doing here. Um, and so before I, int before I list all of our readers here, I wanted to turn it over to Karen Head for a few minutes to say a few words. And just a reminder um, to some of you, but uh, for some of you, you may not have actually heard when we came up with the idea for this anthology. Um, it, it was uh, uh, an idea that we had had for many years, but it, um, it came to life in its most recent form um, because Colin and I are both very attached to uh, the city of Paris, and we were watching uh, the tragic fire at Notre Dame. But, you know, we were also troubled by um, bigger fires here at home, um, fires of, of racism that take down black churches. And, um, and we started thinking about all of those things together. So all of the proceeds um, for this book are being donated. Um, in fact, we just got our first um, royalty checks um, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be posting about the church in Louisiana that we're actually donating to. So remember that not only is it good poetry, it's also a good cause. Um, so <laughs> love a poet by poetry, yes. Uh, thank you, Joe. So um, we just really wanna thank all of you for being here this evening um, and uh, we will uh, get on to what everybody came for, which is some really great poetry. Right. And if you want to buy a copy of the anthology, the fabulous Karis Books and More is yes. our bookseller tonight. Uh, so please support Karis Books. It is a just one of the greatest bookstores in the world, I would say. It's been around for 40 plus years. Our feminist LGBT bookstore uh, now in Decatur, Georgia. Uh, just a fantastic shop. And so if you want to order a copy of the anthology, support your local bookstores and order from Karis. Um, so let me, uh, I'm gonna read you the list of poets uh, who are gonna be reading their poems tonight. And, and then they're gonna briefly introduce themselves before they read their poem. Uh, but our lineup tonight is David Matthew Barnes, Megan Volpert, Cleo Creech, Julie Blomacky, 
Ivy Alvarez, Catherine Clark Sales, J uh, Lila Way, JC Riley, Franklin Abbott, Deborah Hauser, Trevor Healy, Tina Kelly, and Kyle Potvin. So away we go. I'm gonna say one last thing before we turn it over to David Matthew, which is um, this was a, a collection of international poets. And I think we actually are celebrating our farthest away poet um, on this reading. Ivy Alvarez is joining us all the way from New Zealand. Um, so it is actually tomorrow. She can tell us, she can, she can maybe tell us like what we need to know about tomorrow because tomorrow has already come there. So if you've got those lottery numbers, uh, Ivy, let us know what they are, okay? All right, enjoy everyone. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm David Matthew Barnes and I live in Denver, Colorado. <clears throat> My poem is titled Satellite. Mary, where were you when the moon split in two? Were you on the outskirts of town, your back pressed to the holy ground, face up, confusing stars for comets, but still wishing? You heard salvation before you spoke it, the rumble roaring down, slicing the fronds. What a rush. Leaves you to tremble in the quake of your youth until your virginal mind becomes hot and wild, pure. They reach for you, yet you'd rather capture the lunar swirls, hold the shattered moon, tender satellite in your praying hands. Somewhere, the tide is also broken and weeping. Listen, Joseph's been dreaming again. They want to kill your son. They want you to appear every time they need a miracle. You hear the constant desperation of faceless sinners, the haunting echo of their hungry howls calling. Thank you. Hey there, I'm Megan Volbert, AKA page number 84. Uh, this poem is called Giving Thanks at 70. Leo's wife is demented. After dinner, he plays the ukulele while Alvin's wife reflects on the story of how she was recently compelled to disown their second son. Everyone here has aged and they sing along to let it be. At the bridge, Aubrey's wife interjects, McCartney was referring to his own mother, not the virgin mother. Doesn't matter, replies Joseph's wife in Long Islandese. People can take it how they want to take it. No one here whispers because everyone here is a little deaf. Two of the wives can sing beautifully and they harmonize by instinct. They proceed from memory and never find the words of wisdom lyric. Always only remembering there will be an answer. So hey everyone, I'm Cleo Creech. Um, Religion's always been kind of an odd duck for me because I grew up in a very um, conservative religious background. My great, great, great grandfather had actually built the church I grew up in. Uh, it was, our church was so conservative, it actually broke off the Southern Baptist Convention because they weren't conserv conservative enough. Um, and I remember, distinctly remember um, sermons where they bashed Catholics because Catholics weren't real Christians. They were papist and worshiped uh, statues and stuff. So that was kind of my background on Catholicism. Uh, funny thing though, I did go back years later and knock on the door of my old house and ask Ellie if I could look around because I had grown up there. And it's actually a, a Catholic family. And the one whole wall is now full of Catholic statues. And for some funny reason, they had sprayed the ceiling with glitter, which was interesting. But so religion's always been kind of an interesting thing for me. But let's start with this. Mary has left the building. I like those seven day saint candles, cheap dollar ones from the grocery. First was Sacred Heart Jesus and Sweet Vanilla. Then Virgin Mary as our Lady of Guadalupe in a cloying floral scented red wax. Soon after, St. Jude with his pine freshness. But then in a little funky gift shop, I found Frida Kahlo and a cinnamon spice. Soon after, I added 
Ruth Bader Ginsburg, patron saint of justice and general badassery. Anthony Bourdain, saint of cooking, I put in my kitchen window. Then about the patron saints of music, Jagger, Bowie, Prince, and Mercury. Friends brought over new ones saying, I thought of you when I saw this. I had to get a bigger display table. One faithful day, I noticed Mary had somehow left the building. Not the candle, but just the image of Mary on the candle. There were still rays of celestial light, that holy backlighting where she should have been. The little chair beneath her was still there, but looking confused. Mary had become an anti-apparition, conspicuous now in her absence. Did she not like all the competition? Did she not get along with Marilyn or Elvis? Did she not like being one of so many icons? Couldn't compete with all the Etsy shops. Had I not dusted her enough that I put her too far back in the pack? How does one deal with this? A missing Mary is a pretty lame miracle. How is persona non grata a call to faith? Will people line up not to see the Virgin, to worship at the spot Mary used to be? This image when we get, will get no likes on Instagram. Amidst all the Rorschach test of burnt toast, wood grain, and rust stains, do I fall to my knees in prayer, allow the Holy Spirit to wash over me? Or do I take this personally, lash out at my abandonment? Girl, I never liked you anyway. Thank you so much, Cleo and Colin and Karen and Georgia Center for the book. I'm Julie Eblomicki, and I am the author of Slide to Unlock, which debuted in March of 2020, almost a full year ago. And I'm particularly thrilled because the poem that's included in this anthology is also in Slide to Unlock. So I, I feel like they kind of work together. Um, just a quick note, because you're not seeing this on the page, but toward the end of the poem, there is uh, the repetition of Mary. So it's M-A-R-Y, M-A-R-R-Y, and M-E-R-R-Y. This is Statue Prayer at 15. Mother, in my world, virginity is defined by loss. Admission, an easy litmus. As soon as I open to confession, their touches turn from want to sister. But here I am on my knees, still in this jaded light, your static mouth jeweled in the cut of votive flame. What if I believe this is my way? That for once I have found the diadem of no as a kind of salvation, at last a place where I am heard. What if I think of your face, smiling in yes. When I whisper in the thresh of desire, what if I pray to hold, wait for the one true found? I cannot bear their eager lips, their breath heavy at the chapel of want, the way they try their hands at the altar of my legs. I soften to their kisses, yes, the rare sweetness of their words, when they are without motive. Someone has painted a heart on your hand. Someone has touched you with gold. I tip my forehead to your cracked hem, hardened in its line. My knees grow numb with leaning. I whisper up to you, O oh Mary, O oh Mary, O oh Mary. Is it all a trinity of trickery, a prayer of persuasion, of false faith. And still the problem of this star crossed over my body, forever this burden we call light.
Hello, everyone. My name is Ivy Alvarez. I am, in fact, from the future, and everything is as it should be. Um, this poem is called Anointed. One. It would be as if I had been praying all my life, becoming a woman at the same time, forgiving everyone and in continuance. I've only just met my husband, already betrothed, though still to be wed. His face is kind and we are young. Two. God is a hum, a note I know in my heart, hungry and full. I am simultaneous all the time. The kitchen tiles, the pleasant table, at the center, an empty fruit bowl. Which then, the bird or the sound of it, dull on the glass, two steps toward the balcony there. It lies stunned on its back, beak opens, then shuts, claws in reflexive grip, I look at the mark it left outside, a wing beat on the window, soft etched, oils from its feathers traced, a bird in profile. On the balcony, the bird is gone. Three. Perfumed, a sudden gift. In the fruit bowl, a yellow plum, ripening and perfect even then. Hello, I'm Catherine Clark Sales. I'm coming to you from just north of San Francisco. Um, I wrote this poem while I was reading Mary Shevitt's book um, of Mary poems in Carnadine. Self-portrait as annunciation. In Carnadine, sun seen through eyelids closed against delicious heat, vessels traced in black against the glow, a sleepy drowsing buzz, my thoughts, like lacy flowers scattering dust, consider the day and chores, slide near the edge of consciousness to the place where UFOs pair with missing socks and reins of frogs, where odd ideas slip into dreams. So that I stand before a jukebox coined with diamonds to play exactly whatever song is needed now, music keyed in scent, a jazzy eucalyptus, a ballad played in rosemary, notes of lemon leader. I slip a used up wedding ring into the slot and get a musky tune played slow and low for dancing solo. And when the angel taps for cutting in, I smile and dance away. The angel clears his throat, ready to announce. Finger to my lips, I shake my head, dance back into my body, pinking in the sun. Watch shadows flick beneath my lids, content to stretch into the ordered thud of blood, moving under skin from lips to hips to toes. Hello and hello and thank you everyone. Are you hearing me? My name is Lilo Wei. And uh, two little notes on the short poem I'll read for you today. The first one is an epigraph that identifies the subject of the poem as being a venerated Ecuadorian sculpture from 1734. And the last word in this poem is fritillaries. A fritillary is a kind of butterfly. From the winged virgin of Quito, the dancing Madonna, to met Bernardo de la Garda, woodcarver. You made me sweat and weep and dance away my years on the surface of this earth. You put nothing between me and it but a snake, holiest of creatures, because legless, who slithers belly to belly with Mother Earth, skin intimate. I fling the blue shawl you gave me, swing my skirt, laugh faster, stomp higher, swerve and curve in a manner better suited to a Hindu goddess than a Virgin Mary. But look now, 
Today you've carved feathers rippling from my scapula. Well, plume the serpent and wing my dancing feet. Feather my breast and sprout a pair of pinions from my hips. Give me wings that undulate heavier than a condor's, faster than a hummingbird's, more transparent than a cicada's, tinier than a fairy flies. And please, angle all these wings in different and opposing directions, causing me to jig and hula, bellying my dance out of here, flying not straight up with the angels, but sideways with the dragonflies, swooping with the swallows, flitting and staggering with the fritillaries. Thank you. Hi, I'm JC Riley. I'm on page 39. <clears throat> uh, stopping at a Starbucks in Egypt. Mary lifts her feet to the stool beside her, swollen like little glad bags filled with water, as Joe hands her a decaf latte extra foam. He sits down, <clears throat> sips his two shots of espresso, and says, How are you holding up? He looks at her belly shakes his head. Not long now. Oh, you know how it is, says Mary. He's kicking and it's a long way to Bethlehem. She chugs down her latte, detonates a belch. Joe winces. Sorry, hon, she says, grinning. She's been like this ever since the guy with the wings. Joe's dad warned him. Son, he said, when your mom was round yawn with you, all she wanted was wine and euros with extra peanut butter, and she farted enough to start a hole in the ozone layer. That's the way it is with women. Once they got matzos in the oven, their, their manners go straight to Gehenna. So far, his wife hadn't been as bad as that, but Joe stayed in the shop as much as possible, building shelves for sale and a cradle in his spare time. Hey, babe, Mary Weedles. Get me another. I'd get it myself, but Joe slouches back to the counter, buys her a grande, another quarter bushel of wheat he won't see again. When he gives her the drink, he expels a sigh. So much work for someone else's prodigy. Thanks. Hello, uh, my name is Franklin Abbott and I live in Atlanta and uh, it is a pleasure to be here. I'm getting to see friends that I haven't seen during the whole lockdown. And I really, really do appreciate that. Um, my poem is called A Lonely Six of Clubs. The, the, the card I describe in the poem is real. Uh, the situation is you know, a product of my imagination. A lonely six of clubs stuck in a chain link fence, edging a motel parking lot just outside of Birmingham, taken months later to Mother Mary of the Red Hand, who always lives on the outskirts, just shy of the fork in the road. She lives behind the room she works in. You can smell her lunch and barely hear a radio and maybe an old person coughing through the wall richly decorated with religious images, mostly Catholic but eclectic, an illuminated sacred heart at the center, hard to miss underneath peacock feathers in a silver vase. She seems almost tired when she opens the door and welcomes you in and tells you her price, $30 for 15 minutes, directs you to a hard chair opposite where she sits comfortably in a big overstuffed armchair, a wooden tray in front of her, a glass of water on it beside a solid brass candlestick holder. She puts a white candle in, lights it with a match. She blows out with a puff. You smell sulfur, sharp and brief. She closes her eyes for one deep breath, then opens them slowly, looks directly at you and asks, how can I help? I hand her the card, explain how I found it. She smiles and tells me, you make my job easy. 
She takes another breath, holding the card with fingers of both hands in front of her heart. She looks down, inhales, looks up and begins. Are you afraid of ghosts? No, my voice dips in disagreement. She smiles and says, this is always the first question she asks. She pauses as if though more faint music for the, from the other side, a faraway cough. She takes a sip, breathes deeply and resumes. This time as she exhales, the flame of the candle flares and flickers. Do strange people seek you out? She inquires. What do you mean by strange? I reply. Good, she says, then nods her head. Her eyelids droop, her breathing changes. Time passes, she snorts twice and raises her head, hesitates. I hear what sounds like birds singing outside the window. Then her voice, when swallows build, you will begin as well. Begin what, I mutter. She takes another sip and another long pause and then begins, I see a body of water, still water. She seems distracted. Do I hear a toilet flush? It's time to stop now, she says, adding quietly, all will be well, then blows out the candle. As she sees me to the door, holding the 10 and 20 I just gave her, she touches my arm lightly with her other hand. One question for you, she says, if you don't mind. I nod. Why were you there? Why were you in Birmingham? For my grandmother's funeral, I confess. She looks at me like I'm a child. Sweet, she says. She gave you one more clue, a, a kiss goodbye. I sigh, deflated by grief, but I do not cry. Oh, she says abruptly, as if something had just occurred to her, buy yourself a music box, one with a dancer under a globe. Then she catches my eyes with hers. And no matter what anyone tells you, there is never a last chance. I'm Deborah Hauser from Babylon, New York. My poem is on page 89. I'm very happy to be published in this anthology, not only for the quality of the writing and the professionalism, but also for the social justice advocacy. Hail Mary. Anonymous among women, we wait, sharing a communal grief. By tacit agreement, we exchange only furtive glances denying ourselves the comfort of direct eye contact. A sterile nurse announces my name. I follow her down a hollow hall to a stark room. I strip, lay myself bare on the sacrificial altar. This thin gown offers no protection against the chill steel table. Feet in stirrups, eyes pinned to the ceiling, a water stain contorts into the face of the Virgin Mary. My fingers ache to count the long abandoned beads of my first rosary, a gift for my communion, the tiny gold cross dangling from a string of iridescent pearls. Caressing them, I felt superior. I fell to my knees to scoop them up when they broke. Cheap plastic beads skittered across the floor in the first aid aisle of the drugstore. But mother yanked me to my feet. Leave that junk, she hissed, pulling me along behind her to the checkout line. I try to recall the prayers I used to recite, kneeling at my bed, palms pressed tightly together. The nape of my neck glowed beneath the heat of his gaze. Hail Mary, Mother Mary comes to me. She disappears into the ceiling tile. Hi, I'm Trevor Healy. Can everybody hear me? And I'm going to read a poem called Black Madonna. Thank you all for being here. All the dark mountains are her, and she sits within them, as if within a shawl of snow, of stone, our lady of the dark blood, 
menstruating volcano. I get used to the heat of this molten flow. I get used to it like hot water scalding and let it burn me. Her companionship is a sweat lodge and I let myself burn and soften like a squash. I'm a blackened potato and pain is more about time, more about acceptance, which too is about time than suffering. Time is a crooked old man she drives away with stones. And I am more about night, more about confusion, more about blindness and surrender, more about black smoke and choking, more about a black hole than a star, and she's told me they are the same. And when I, and when I awake in the middle of the night, her body before me, the sacred mountain, I see the rage of her tenderness. The night sky is a charred forest fire of starlight burning embers. O oh, dark mother, you press wisdom into us like clay. We are the weakest kind of stone. Tina, you're up next. Sorry, I didn't know that Grace wasn't here. My name is Tina Kelly. I'm coming to you from Maplewood, New Jersey. I'm honored to be part of this beautiful collection and this gathering tonight. Uh, the poem I'm going to read is on page 65 and it's called Paradolia, or if it makes them pray, that's okay. Um, that's a quote from Reverend Father John Straithoff of Accra, Ghana, regarding the image of Christ's face found in the grotto. And pareidolia, pareidolia is the human tendency to recognize faces in objects. Milk and honey was in a bad place, about to cast herself into the sea, when something brushed her foot, driftwood with the face of Jesus staring at me. Now her life is fine, and I wish upon whom every is to win this will have the same fortune I did, starting bid $15. It didn't sell. But other items have, of course, the $28,000 grilled cheese sandwich, the offshore casino won at auction for publicity, the sandwich nibbled, our lady's face discovered, all of it wrapped in cotton, kept in plastic and it never grew moldy. It brought the owner luck, frequent wins at the casino, not to mention fame and $28,000 on eBay. If I were Mother Teresa's image, I am not. I think I really would inhabit that Dorito. If I were Mary, I would peek out of the knots of the pine ceiling of Joey B's bedroom in Detroit. I would etch myself in the stump of the hacked sumac in a crack in the overpass in Patterson, New Jersey, in the grayest, most Spanish speaking neighborhood where the Superfund sites outnumber steeples almost. If I were the baby Jesus, I might skip the Pizza Hut billboard in Atlanta and that Frito, though there's an argument to make for the pierogi in Pittsburgh with all those homesick Belarusians. I'd get a kick out of the Cone Nebula, a fine place for watching eternity. The Chihuahua's ear in Tennessee was perfect swaddling. Mary gets extra credit for hiding in that sonogram of the eight week, four day old child. God bless the human brain for the hardwiring that sees the face everywhere. Thank you. Wonderful, Tina. Such a pleasure to be here. I'm Kyle Potvin from the Boston area. And thank you all for being here. Mysteries of the Corn. Your priest of 20 years retires. Then your hairdresser. Elephants become sacred and the circus leaves town forever. Even the only queen you've known is blue, wearing sapphires from her dead father. Loss is the corn on your door. 16 rows, 800 kernels. You finger each like a rosary bead. 
Hail Mary, mother of yours, lost in plaques and tangles. Glory be to your father, livelihood lost to her care. Hail Holy Queen, watch over the teen shot near the corner and for the one who died of conjecture. Our Father, remember the birch lost to infestation and the road around the lake no longer traveled. Each year the husk dries, decays a bit more, but you hang it anyway, a totem to stubbornness. After all, an ear to the ground is useless. You know what's coming. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kyle. And thank you to everyone who read tonight. Just beautiful. Uh, all of these that we have done have just been just spectacular because the work is just so incredible. Karen and I still talk about this. You know, we got three over 300 poems uh, submitted for this anthology and narrowing it down to the ones that made it in literally just one of the I think one of the most difficult decisions I've ever had to make I know Karen would probably agree uh, but just just in all of the work it was it was really tough to, to narrow it down because we had just a, an embarrassment of, of riches of poetry um, so just really really thrilled uh, that everyone could be here really thrilled that Ivy is here from New Zealand Trevor are you in Mexico City right now Uh, no, I'm in LA right now, but I, I was there until May and then I came back here. Yeah. I got you. Okay. All right. Yeah. When you submitted, you were in Mexico City. So I was like, we're really international. Um, thanks for being here, though. Thanks, everyone, for being here. So if we've got some questions, yeah. um, please put them in the, in the, in the Q&A, the comments, or I think, Joe, can they raise their hand? How, how are we doing it? They can either type them in the chat or go ahead and put it with the Q&A. Um, okay. We can see them if they, they raise their hand, but with a webinar, we don't have the ability to recognize them. Yeah. Right, gotcha. So if any of our viewers have questions, please type them in. Um, be happy to try and answer. Getting some wonderful compliments over in the chats. Yeah, I see wonderful compliments, yes. Well, if we don't have any questions, uh, let me just say uh, thank you to Georgia Center for the Book, as always, for hosting this event, yeah. for all the events that they host. Just, you know, Joe and Allie just do brilliant, brilliant work uh, hosting all these events. And doing it, although Zoom doesn't have, you know, the intimacy of a live reading, it really has allowed us to have Ivy uh, from New Zealand and poets from the West Coast and that we would never be able to get all in the same room to do a reading like this. So really, you know, this whole Zoom thing does have its pluses occasionally. Um, Karen, you have any? Yeah, no, I was thinking the same thing. I mean, you know, it's, um, you know, for, for, for the things that are, that are taken away, there are the things that are given. And I, I know certainly, um, we owe a huge debt to the Georgia Center for the Book. I mean, hosting us not once, but twice, um, which, is, which is extraordinary. And to give, it's rare that I've been in a situation um, where I either uh, was in an anthology or I was associated with an anthology in any way, um, where there have been so many events available to get so many of the writers involved. Um, you know, there's often kind of that one event or maybe there's, you know, a couple of events or even sometimes, um, I know some of us were actually in an anthology uh, called the Nasty Women's uh, Poetry Anthology. Grace Bauer, who couldn't be here tonight, um, and Julie Kane um, edited that anthology. And there were, there were regional readings sort of all around. Um, and there was one sort of, uh, you know, larger reading at AWP, but not everybody could, you know, could be at those. And there were still lots of writers whose voices that we never heard from. I think here in Atlanta, there were what, maybe maybe five or six of us at the reading um, that we had here. So 
um, I think it's just such an extraordinary opportunity to be able to have everybody together. And, um, and I hope that moving forward, we're able to kind of continue. I know there's going to be a little bit of the pendulum, you know, kind of swinging and everybody's going to be like, I don't ever want to do a, a video conference ever again. Right. But I do hope that we remember like the value of this hybridity and that we continue to invite people in, people who can't get out to readings. Um, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of people for whom, you know, going to a public reading just isn't physically possible. And so, um, again, it's the social justice question, right? So we need to, we need to make sure that we're being as inclusive as we possibly can. But, you know, again, Colin and I just, years ago when we started talking about this, we just honestly couldn't have imagined an anthology as beautiful as the one that you all have given us. And so, we, you know, we thank all the, the writers and all the people who have supported and all the people who are here watching um, and who've been at the other readings. Um, it's, it's just been such, and, and continues to be such a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I see a, I see a question over here. I think, uh, Colin and Karen, could you speak about, wait, I can't see my whole screen. My whole chat screen is falling off the edge of the computer. Could you speak about how you decided the sections for the anthology and the titles for each section? Yeah, so um, when we had made the final decision about the poems, um, we, we started sort of grouping it. So we worked kind of separately and, and we grouped poems separately. Um, and then we got together and said, okay, so he, here are the themes that we see. Um, and we had, we had more themes than we ultimately wound up with. I mean, you know, because sometimes there'd only be like, maybe two or three poems. And then we'd say, well, okay, so if we, if we think a little bit more broadly, is there a theme? And so um, the themes emerged pretty quickly, um, I think overall, I mean, that, that there were sort of the, the slightly more religious poems. And then there were um, sort of what we were calling sort of poems related to art or acrastic, directly acrastic poems in some cases. And um, that part I think was, was the harder sort of I mean, sequencing any journal is always the hard part. Um, and then sequencing the sections. But the actual titles of the sections, that's one of the easiest things. I mean, Colin and I both are such like major pop music um, fans that we kind of just knew, like it was so clear what various section titles were gonna be. So um, yeah. That came up, that, that happened pretty quickly. I think I came up with a list of, after we decided what the sections thematically were, I came up with a list of pop music titles and sent them to Karen. And we kind of went back and forth on that for like a day, I think. Uh, and we, we had it figured out. And, you know, it was, uh, we did want to keep that pop culture thing going throughout. So, yeah, for sure. Um, and I'm seeing, oh yeah, um, yes, it will be, this will, if you, if this, this video, this rating will be available online, it's at the Georgia Center for the Book YouTube channel, they'll have it on their Facebook page, uh, and you can, not only this one, but the previous one that we did back in, uh, November is there too, so definitely jump back and check that one out, we had like 20 plus readers that night, so it was, uh, that was a big one, um, and we're going to we're going to have another rating in March. And so if you will, if you make sure and follow the uh, Mother Mary Comes to Me Facebook page, we will have the details about that rating posted up probably by the end of this week. Uh, and we're hoping to that some of the people you saw tonight will be there. We're hoping to get a few of the others that haven't been able to read yet to, to be on this one. Um, and yeah, we're very excited about that, that this will be our fourth reading from this anthology. We could just keep going. Um, but yeah, it's really great. And just another mention too, uh, I, I mentioned at the top uh, that the, the anthology is a, a nominee for the Georgia Author of the Year Award. Um, and also Kyle Potvin is up for a Pushcart Prize. Uh, Madville uh, picked six poems to uh, nominate for the push cart and uh, Kyle's poem. Uh, we selected Kyle's poem for that. Uh, so fingers crossed uh, for that. And be sure to 
share the book with everyone, let everyone know, post about it on Facebook and Instagram and whatever social media you're on and help Madville um, sell some more books. They've just been brilliant to work with. Um, and so just couldn't be more happy about the reception the anthologies received at working with Madville. And, uh, and we'll, be, we'll also be posting, um, as Karen mentioned earlier, we've, we're narrowing down the, uh, the church that we're gonna make our first donation to, uh, and we'll be posting about that uh, on the Facebook page. And we'll talk about it in the next, uh, at the next reading too, about who's getting, who's getting our first donation uh, of our royalties. Well, um, again, thanks to to uh, to Joe and to Allie. Uh, Allie, the superhero who's always behind the scenes hiding. She never shows. She never shows herself. So, um, but she's the one who who coordinates all the, the technology and makes sure that we can all be here. So, big props to to A. So. Um, and, and Poetry Atlanta, we will be back uh, in April. Uh, I don't have the exact date now off the top of my head, toward the end of April, I believe, for our annual uh, National Poetry Month reading. Uh, we're going to have a great lineup for that. I can tell you uh, that one of our readers is going to be Kai Coggin. I'm very excited about that. Uh, and, uh, and we'll be announcing the, the list of other readers. It will be virtual, of course. Um, and uh, we hope to have a, a possibly an international reading from that too. So stay tuned. April 26th, thanks Joe and Allie for posting that. April 26th will be our National Poetry Month reading. Um, so just watch the Georgia, for the Georgia Center for the Books website and their Facebook page and social media. It'll be listed on there too. So thanks everybody. Thanks. Great. Thanks for everybody Thank who read and thanks to all of our viewers who tuned in to, to watch and listen tonight. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Karen. Everyone, don't forget, Karis Books and More is, of course, the local store that you can get a copy of Mother Mary Praise to Me through their order link. Or if you are here, there in New Zealand, if you are in Mexico, Los Angeles, wherever you are, um, go and ask your local independent bookstore. It's so important to support our local independent booksellers, especially when they are Black-owned businesses, and we encourage you to do that. Um, also, just a reminder that on March 3rd, we are hosting another one in our series uh, for Stephanie Burt's Advice from the Lights, which is the NEA Big Read that we are doing with Seven Stages Atlanta. Um, that talk will be at 7 p.m. and will feature Scott Turner Schofield. Um, it's called Dysphoria or Hormones Don't Harm Trans People, People Do. Also, if you would like to get a copy of this book, they are free for you. Um, go ahead and shoot us an email and we will connect you all with seven stages. They have been handing these out at the local farmer's market that takes place in Little Five Points in Atlanta, um, or they're good at rooting them to you somehow um, via mail or maybe pick up at the theater. Um, but that's Advice from the Lights by Stephanie Burt. It's a wonderful collection of poems that we are celebrating throughout this year. So thank you all once again very, very much for joining us, whether it is 8 p.m., 8 a.m., or tomorrow. Tomorrow. Exactly. Um, still waiting on those lottery numbers, you know, because we all, you know, poets and like um, nonprofits. 10 p.m. So, tomorrow in New Zealand. I still can't get over it. <laughs> Excellent. Once again, thank you, Colin. Thank you, Karen. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. We hope you had a wonderful time. We hope to see you in person someday very soon. But until then, we will see you back here virtually very, very soon. Thank you all very much. Good night.